The more of the word you study, the more you develop your spirit man. The Christian life is not just uh, for worshiping and then just learning the Bible like, you know, uh, a storybook. No, it's a life given to us to live. See, it's a life given to us to live 24 hours a day, seven days a week. All right? That's what we're supposed to do. Living a Christian life is not a religious life. It's a divine life. It's the life and nature of God in a human being. That's what Christianity is. You know, those who don't know what it is, call it a religion. They say, oh, the Christian religion. But Christianity, by its very nature and definition, is not a religion at all. There is a religion in Christianity. But Christianity is not a religion. That's, that's very important. Very, very important. Most people don't know that. A lot of Christians live their whole life without ever coming across those facts in the Word of God because they don't study the Bible. And yet Jesus told us to search the Scriptures. You don't tell somebody to search, you know, check. Check your box for something if you, if you don't know there's something in there. You tell us to search because you know there's something in there. You can find it except you search for it. So he says, search the scriptures. Paul the apostles, the apostles said, study, study, study. Not just read, study. Study. Study the word. There's a whole lot in there you will never find without studying. There's a whole lot in there you will never find without studying. And let me explain something to you. Why it is so important you've got to study the Word of God. See, you came from the Word. You are what you eat. How many of you ever heard that term? You are what you eat. Your body is made up of what you eat. Think about it. Imagine that you're 40 years old or you're 70 years old. It means you've been eating food for 70 years. Where did it all go? Oh, you say you passed. Oh, no, you, you only passed out the waste that your body didn't need. So all of the others, where'd they go? Your body. Your physical body is the result of what you've been eating. It is even more true with your spirit. It is even more true with your spirit. Your spirit came from God's word. Your spirit came from God's word. You are the offspring of God's word. When you were born again, the life and nature of God was imparted to your spirit and you came alive to God. You are awakened to the fatherhood of God. He became your father, not just your creator, but your father. Your life is one with him now. So the development of your spirit is based on the increase of the Word in you. The more of God's Word that you receive into your spirit, the more you are built spiritually. If you don't get the Word into your spirit, you are not built spiritually. So what happens is, your physical body is growing because of the physical food you've been eating, but your spirit will not grow. Your spirit will not grow. You can't know the things of God without studying the Word. You've got to hear the Word. You've got to meditate on the Word of God to grow spiritually. And spiritual growth is of utmost necessity. You've got to get it. You've got to get it. Otherwise, 
you, 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 can't, you can't develop in your relationship with your heavenly father. And then you can't put to work spiritual realities. And worse more, you can't live the spiritual life even though you're a spirit being. It's like a, 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 an eagle that's brought up among chickens. Never learned to fly. Never learned to fly. He'll never know he's an eagle. He'll move along with chickens and live the life of chickens. But he's an eagle with powerful wings to fly, but never seen another eagle fly. Even when he sees them flying, doesn't know how because he was never trained to fly. Never trained to use his wings. Running on the ground, jumping up a little like all the other chickens. Sad life. But do you realize that's the way many Christians live? They don't know that they have power over sickness. Sickness is natural to them. It's normal to them. Headaches, colds, and fever, they're normal to them. Because all the people they grew up with had colds, uh, malaria, fever, headaches. So it's normal in their home. It's normal. Everybody knows what to take when the head starts kinking. So they know what to take. Everybody's just grown up that way. It's just their normal life. They, it's so normal to them, they think it's from God. Because that's the way they were brought up. Their mother was doctor in the home. So they've grown up like that. And then they told them, well, you know, when you get 60, you're going to have uh, arthritis. Because mama had arthritis. Grandma had arthritis. Daddy had heart trouble. Or even stroke. So when they start getting close to that age, they know what's coming. Doctor said so, because doctor even experienced the same thing. The doctors treating them has arthritis too. <laughs> yeah. So it, it, that's the normal life they're living. And they're Christians. They've been Christians many years. So if you said, Sickness is not normal. They say, oh, no, 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 no. Don't get fanatical. Don't get fanatical. Everybody gets sick. Because they've never studied the Bible. That's what they learned. That's what they learned. They don't know what Jesus did for them. They say, what did Jesus do for you? And they say, well, he died for my sins. But that's not, oh, oh, a thousand times, no. That's what he did for the world. What did they do for Christians? Listen, listen and listen hard. The sin problem that Jesus came to get rid of was for a purpose. He saved you from sin for a purpose. In the Old Testament, Moses said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God brought you out of bondage that he may bring you in to your inheritance. He brought you out to bring you in. He didn't just bring you out. For some people, you know, uh, I'm saved. You know, back in those days, you know, uh, uh, when we were in that, um, that church where we grew up, we used to sing a song. We could sing it half an hour. And all it said, I am happy, I am saved, I am saved, I am saved, I am happy, I am saved, hallelujah. And we'll just sing that song again and again. And everybody's dancing and shouting. And, you know, they're just so excited. They didn't know why they were saved. Saved for what? They had no idea. I ask people, do you believe in Jesus? And they say, yes. Then I say, when you believed in Jesus, what did you get? They're startled. They didn't think they were supposed to get anything. They say, pardon me? I say, when you believed in Jesus, what did you get for believing? They, they say, they don't understand my question. They're surprised I would even ask. Because they don't know they were supposed to get something. Then I say, but Jesus said, He that believeth in me hath everlasting life. Oh, they say, oh yes, I know that. Oh yes, yes, yes. 
I have everlasting life. So I said, what's everlasting life? They have no idea. There's a life, life that continues to go on and on and on and on. And then when we go into heaven, it just continues on and on and on and on. Then I said, well, what does that mean for you? They have no idea. Because they never studied the Word of God. They were never taught the Scriptures. They were never taught. Take coming to church seriously. Now, because if you keep coming, you're going to learn so much, you'll be amazed. I remember a gentleman said to me, he had been attending our church. This was about his second year. And then he said to me, he said, Pastor Chris, this was a, a very educated gentleman. You know, widely traveled. He said to me, Pastor Chris, I never knew I would discover so much in my life. I never knew. Yes, I said, there's still so much more. Still so much more. Still so much more. You'd be amazed at what you'd learn if you're consistent. Consistent. You know, if you, if you come to church today, then you don't come next time. And then, then suddenly you remember, and then you come again. It's like a school. It's like a school. If you go to school like that, you fail. There has to be a consistency in your life for growth. See? The many things that we have to, we have to do in building our lives. Building, building, building. How do we worship God? How do we worship Him? Somebody said, God wants us to worship Him. Well, Jesus said, God is a spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. That means it's so important the Father wants them. Doesn't that mean we've got to find out what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. What does that mean? Such things you learn. You learn from the word of God. Hallelujah. And then you'll be amazed at your growth, at your wisdom, at the way you relate with others, at the things happening in your life. You will be amazed. You will know you're growing. You'd see your life going upward and forward. You'd see it. You know, there are a lot of people, so many Christians, who are looking for somebody to pray for them. They got this problem, they got the other challenge, they got this. And, and oh, if they could only get somebody to counsel them. Oh, if they could only get somebody to pray with them. You would move out of that class. Because you would have the knowledge of the Word of God. You would know what to do. The biggest problem that a lot of people have, it's not really what the problem itself is, it is that they don't know what to do about their problem. That's bigger than the problem itself. When you face a crisis and you don't know what to do, it's not the bigness of the problem because it might just be solved in a very simple way. But because you don't know what to do, you, you're like, oh God, I need a miracle. And maybe you don't need a miracle. You just need to know what to do. Glory to God. Alright, now, I want to read something you would like it. First Peter, in chapter number 1, from verse 1. You ready? Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which, according to His abundant mercy, hath begotten us again. Unto King James is a lively hope. It means a living hope. 
by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that faded not away, reserved in heaven for you. Look at that. Isn't that wonderful? A living hope to an inheritance incorruptible. Reserved, he says, in heaven for you. But let's go to the second Peter and see. This one is reserved in heaven. But what about the one that's not reserved in heaven, the one that's here and now? All right? Second Peter. And we will begin with verse 1. Chapter 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. I love this. Look at, look at what it says. It says, to them that have obtained like precious faith. How did they obtain the faith, this precious faith? How did they get it? In Romans chapter 12 and verse 3, read it for me. Romans chapter 12, verse number 3. Uh-huh. For I say, mm -hmm, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, uh-huh, mm-hmm, but according to as God had dared to every man. God dared to every man the, the measure of faith. That means he gave to every one of us the same amount of faith. The same seed of faith. Like precious faith. This is every one of us who obtained like precious faith. Hallelujah. Okay, so go back to Second Peter chapter 1. We are in verse 2. It says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through prayer. Father, give me grace. Father, give me grace. Father, give me grace. Give me peace. Oh, I need peace in my home, in my home, in my life, in my hand, in my leg, in my body. <laughs> grace and peace be multiplied unto you. How? <laughs> through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Through the knowledge of God. How do you know God? What kind of knowledge is he talking about? Here, what he says, through the knowledge of God, he's not dealing with, like, the knowledge of sciences. The knowledge that you gain um, by just finding out about something. No. It's a different type of knowledge. Glory to God. Okay. Uh, there, he's dealing with absolute knowledge. Absolute knowledge that comes through revelation and relationship. It's called epignosis. Okay, now this is grace and peace be multiplied unto you. So if I want to multiply grace and peace in my life, I've got to know more about God and Jesus Christ. And this type of knowledge is not just the knowledge that I read in history books. It comes through revelation. And part of it is already given to you in the Word of God. See? The rest of it is through your relationship with Him in fellowship through the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. This is so powerful. God has given to us by His divine power, His divine ability, He's given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. All things. Imagine that you, you didn't have money for your school fees and you found out about this. Imagine that you were, you were down and out financially. You needed money to start a business and you found out about this. What happened to you? Imagine that you were confused about what to do about your finances. So broke. You didn't know what to do. And you found out about this. According as his divine power hath given unto us 
all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Everything that I require for life. When I found out about this, I knew forever I would never be broke. I was a young man in my teenage years when I found out about this. And I'll come home, you know, sharing the same thing with the rest of the family. My dad then, you know, because I came from a Christian family, you understand? Everybody went to church. But then they got surprised about some of these things I was finding in the Word of God. Because they weren't used to studying the Bible like that. They read through. See, and my dad would say, well, where are you getting those things from? See, I said, look at it here. Because I believe they told me the Bible was the Word of God. If it's the Word of God, then it didn't lie to us. If God's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, listen, we'll be gathered in the house. My dad's sharing. Once in a while, he'll tell me to say something. Or else I'll raise my hand, I've got something to say. <laughs> then I'll share a little bit. They often got amazed at what I was saying. But I didn't say nothing new. It was in the book all the time. And when I see something like this, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, we got it made. We got it made. Glory to God. Oh, That's all I needed. Through the knowledge of him. Oh God. How powerful this is. How? How did he give it to us? He says, through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. He's called us to glory and virtue. That means to glory and excellence. He's called us to glory and excellence. How could I be poor anymore? Never. That'll never happen. See what I mean? Doesn't matter which country. How could I be sickly? No, never. You see? He's called us to glory and virtue. Wow. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Oh God. I decided to do a little bit of a study on that. Partake us. Coin on us. Coin on us. That means one that is an associate. Partaker here does not mean that uh, I partook of the food with you. You know, we were eating together. No, 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 no. That's metalambano. Metalambano means... Partaking together in something. Partaking. Sharing like we're sharing food. We can share food. Doesn't mean we're fellowshipping. Wow. That's meta lambano. See, but when you say coin on us, you're dealing with association, comradeship. A fellowship. A communion. A moving together. In oneness. One heart, one mind. Then it says, partake us of the divine nature. Divine nature is not, even, is not even correctly rendered. It is theas fusios. Meaning, oh dear, the God kind. Not divine nature. It means God kind. Theas fusios. God kind, like you say, mankind. So he's saying that we become associates of the God kind. That means that he's brought us into fellowship with the God kind. This is amazing. So he, we are no longer fellowshipping with men. We are fellowshipping with God. We are no longer ordinary men. He's brought us into oneness with God. There is a realm in which we now move. 
Oh, hallelujah. Your princely life has begun. Your royal life has begun. That's why he says you are a royal priesthood. The more of the word you study, the more you develop your spirit man. What is it to believe in Jesus Christ and not have the Holy Spirit in you? What does it mean? St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. I wonder why you wouldn't want to receive the Holy Spirit. What in the world is keeping you from re receiving the Holy Spirit? So, verse 44, Matthew chapter 12, verse 44. Well, let me read it from verse 43, to be better from verse 43. So, Matthew's gospel, chapter 12, from verse 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. When you are born again, and you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, that describes your condition. Remember I told you, when you're born again, you're recreated by the Holy Ghost. You become the house of God. Imagine that the house of God has been built, but it is empty, swept, garnished. So it's decorated, it's dressed, but it's empty. In other words, no one's living in it. So look at the next verse. Then goeth he, then the devil, that demon that went out, he says, then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Do you know what happens to people after they've supposedly given their hearts to the Lord? But they never allow the Holy Spirit to come into them and live in them. They are often the ones that become the deep state. They are the ones that persecute Christians, persecute churches. Because they say they know what happens in church. They have become reverends. They have been bishops. They have been preachers. They have been elders. They have been in Christianity for a long time. They've been helping with counting the offerings. So they are the ones. Because the Spirit of God doesn't live in them. The title never gives you the Holy Spirit. The number of times you go to church will not give you the Holy Spirit. So even though the unclean spirit went out of you when you gave your life to the Lord, because you didn't occupy your spirit with the Holy Spirit, it is swept, that means it's clean, but it is empty. Garnished. So your heart is beautified. You have nice thoughts. You love God. You are kind. But you are empty. And that's why it's easy for you to fall into temptations. I'll show you something. Romans chapter 3, chapter 8, verse 13. You'd see this now. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit... Do modify the deeds of the, of the body, you shall live. You see, you cannot control your body except through the Holy Ghost. He says, but if through the Spirit you modify the deeds of the body, through the Spirit, you can only do that through the Spirit. Without the Holy Ghost, you cannot restrain yourself. You always fall into temptation. 
because the Holy Spirit doesn't have his way in your life. Are you, are you following this? In, in Acts chapter 19, from verse 1, let me show you what happened. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Notice, he saw some disciples, certain disciples. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since he believed? I wonder why he had to ask them. I think I know. I think I know. Because when you come among those that are the Holy Ghost, I mean, they've been hearing of Paul. And Paul comes and they all say, welcome, sir. Good morning, sir. Welcome, sir. If they had the Holy Ghost, man, go, go, brother. You know, I mean, they'll be out there. Oh, glory to God. Won't be long before something comes out of them. You know, but they, 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 they're just like cold and in them. So he says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? <laughs> it turned out they hadn't. Look at it. Look at it. Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. They hadn't even heard there was a Holy Ghost. And he was stunned. Look at the next verse. He said unto them, unto what did we ye baptize? And they said, oh, yeah, unto John's baptism. Oh, he said, I know now. No wonder. <laughs> so he had to explain to them. Then you get to verse number six. See, he explains some stuff to them. Then the Bible says that when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. He laid hands on them. Some weeks ago, when we were, when we were on this broadcast, and I said, we're going to pray for you to receive the Holy Ghost. There were four pastors who said they hadn't received the Holy Ghost before. And the Holy Ghost came on them where they were. Yes, sir. Glory to and they received the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues and prophesy. These were pastors. Thank God for what happened to you. And today I'm going to lead in prayer. And there are many of you that will receive the Holy Ghost. Just get yourself ready. Get yourself ready. Because without the Holy Ghost, you can't go far. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of... I just said, there's no need to reinterpret that. What is the Spirit of Christ? Let's see. Let's see what the, the word says. Go back to that verse. Verse 9. Chapter 8. Book of Romans. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. What he's saying is exactly the same thing. In fact, the reason for saying, uh, for distinguishing here between the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ is because the Apostle is claiming in this verse the deity of Christ. He's trying to say the Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. That Christ is God. This is what the Apostle is trying to tell you. He's telling that Christ is God. Hallelujah. Okay, just, just for the records. Who is the Spirit of Christ? Is it, is it the same as the Spirit of God? Is it the same as the Holy Ghost? All right. Because there are those who think that, oh, this just means character. No, a thousand times. Without the Holy Spirit, you cannot have the character of Christ. How could you? It's impossible. In fact, learn this. The Christian life is impossible without the Holy Spirit. Jesus had to have the Holy Spirit. The apostles had to have the Holy Spirit. How come only you, 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 you think you don't need the Holy Spirit? What kind of Christianity is yours going to be? All right, let's, let, let's pick verses. Philippians chapter 1 verse 19. Philippians chapter 1 verse 19. Just a few scriptures. Look at this. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. So can we, can we assume that the Spirit of Jesus Christ is the same as the Spirit of Christ, right? Okay, just, just, I, I just want to show you terminologies, okay? All right. Now go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 11. 
No, I, I'll start reading from verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets, mark that, have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. The prophets prophesied. Searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. That means they prophesied by the Spirit of Christ. It means the Spirit of Christ signified, prophesied through them. When it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. So what spirit testified through the prophets? The spirit of Christ. Meaning that the prophets spoke by the spirit of Christ. Okay. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Isn't that the same spirit that just, we just read about him in First Peter. So the Holy Ghost is the spirit of Christ. So those holy men that he was talking about, he says the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So he prompted the words. He prompted the prophetic utterance. So the Spirit of Christ is the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of God. Oh, blessed be God. Thank you, Lord Jesus.